Hello, everyone. I'm Nina Collins. We're here at Hello Revel, the events and community platform for women over 40. And we do these regular weekly podcast recordings where we do them in webinar style. Um, so I was just saying to the attendees, if you want to ask a question and you don't want to be recorded, just put your question in the written chat. But if you're game for being recorded and you don't have to identify yourself, of course, raise your hand and then I will unmute, I will I will say allowed to talk and you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, but first, Suzanne and I will just talk a bit. So today our guest is Dr. Suzanne Gilbert Lenz and the subject today is Perimenopause 101. And I think for, I mean, certainly for people like you, this must be old hat, but even for someone like me, who's been doing this for six years, I, you know, I started the community, what would Virginia Woolf do when I was 46? And I started it entirely because I was starting perimenopause and had no idea what was happening mm -hmm. to my body. So it was really like a help. I need to talk to my girlfriend's moment. I wasn't sleeping well in my case, particularly. Um, and since then, you know, I've gone on to create this community and now I'm in a different phase of my life. I'm 52, I'm post menopausal. Um, I actually feel pretty great now, um, but I run this community. Well, now I, now I'm, my community was bought by Hello Revel and now I'm, a, I work as kind of creative and partnership at Hello Revel. But um, in always thinking about good content, it occurs to me that we have to always be going back to the core of what we're, what women are concerned with as they're getting older, which is the mm -hmm. of perimenopause. This is, yeah. the this is a big dividing line in our lives. And it's a moment as we've acknowledged before that like everyone talks about adolescence and getting your period and getting pregnant, but people do not talk about perimenopause. No. So welcome. Suzanne, by the way, is a, um, doctor in Beverly Hills. She's actually the doctor of our dear friend, Susan Feldman. I love that fact um, at Get In The Groove. She um, is an integrative medicine specialist an Ayurvedic medicine specialist, sexual wellness. She has a monthly newsletter that's great. She has an Instagram called um, Ask Dr. Suzanne, Suzanne with a Z. Her website is thedrsuzanne.com. She's writing a book, which I'm sure she'll tell us about. Um, she's super lovely. She and I have met quite a few times before. And so you are here today to help us do Perimenopause 101. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Nina. I mean, as you and I have discussed many times before, I what you do is so important because it is this like moment of mystery for people and not in like a fun Nancy Drew kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> No, like in a really scary, like, am I dying? I just, this, that just came to me. I feel like I should have that as the cover of my book. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, the post that was a constant running joke, but so true is, is this cancer or is this perimenopause? It's, 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 it's nightmarish. And you know, you, you hit it on the head and we would never let our kids go through puberty without having so many conversations and prepping them and normalizing and blah, 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 you know? So this is a convergence as we all know and have discussed ad nauseum of all sorts of isms that are not super helpful. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about whatever you all want me to talk about. I wanna help support people through their journey and, and a couple of things, not ever a one size fits all. There are a lot of things. I think we've all seen these listicles, the 34 symptoms of, I'm like, what is that? You know, but I understand what that is. It's people grasping at trying to get some information, but I'm going to offer an unpopular opinion, which is that I feel like we should, can we find a way to acknowledge this period of our lives and validate it without like turning it into a diagnosis. The word perimenopause is important because people need terms and they need to have a way to grasp onto the information. But I, and I feel early on, like naming it was a really big, important thing, right? Because people weren't talking about it. People were getting blown off. People were getting gaslit. All sorts of people are getting scared. They're going online thinking they're dying. Um, and now I'm a little bit like, are we pathologizing something that's normal? You know, I, I actually join you. I'm of two minds, though, because I do feel like when I say, oh, we all know this now, a lot of people every no, day you're right. are like, what is happening to me? And no one. So I kind of feel you and I, because we're we now work in this, we yes. know we're in this space, we feel like it's everywhere. But I do think that and that's why I wanted to do this episode. I yep. do think that we have to 
remember that it's we're a long way off from a place where women are really um, advised about this. So why don't 100%. We start, I'm actually super curious later in the conversation, I want to ask about a book that I learned about on your website, which I just ordered called The Handbook of Wellness Medicine. Oh. So I'd like, I'd like to kind of get to talking about some wellness stuff, but why yeah. don't we talk about what are the most obvious symptoms of like, how does a woman know she's entering into perimenopause and is there anything she can do to prepare herself? Well, I think just knowing that it's, it's coming is that's the best preparation and making sure that you have either a trusted source of information, whether that is your own personal physician or care provider and the support, I think of other people that, you know, or find, because I don't know that there's not a thing that you're going to do to prepare for it. That's going to prevent certain things. Right. I think it will mitigate and mod you'll be able to mitigate issues. You'll be able to jump on things faster, like sleep issues, mood issues. Um, you'll understand that you're not going crazy, but that there are things to do that can help you and that there are multiple things to do in multiple arenas and you may have to do a little bit of experimentation and searching but you're going to get some help if you have the right resources so i think the first thing that changes for most people is their menstrual cycle if they've been used to a certain kind of menstrual cycle and when i say menstrual cycle as a gynecologist i'm not just talking about when you bleed i'm talking about the entire thing which is like your whole life right so the first couple of, you know, day one is the first day you bleed, and then you're going to bleed however long you bleed. Then you're going to go into what's called the follicular phase. Okay. Where a follicle is getting chosen and the, the egg, the egg is going to get chosen, right? The chosen one. And then you're going to release that egg typically mid cycle, right? Halfway ish between. And then when you don't conceive, things switch over and there's a sort of a flip-flop of the dominance of different hormones that we make. And eventually the lining of your uterus breaks off, releases, and you're bleeding again. So we're talking about all of those events and not just from the standpoint of the bleeding, but all the hormones that are being produced, the way your brain talks to your ovaries, the way that influences the lining of your uterus. It turns out your uterus is actually having something to say as well. We're learning more about how the uterus may be influencing our hormonal production as well. So as these things start to shift, and for some people, it'll be in their late thirties, for some people, it'll be in their late forties, we start to notice differences, whether that is the bleeding pattern changes, maybe closer together, maybe heavier, maybe starting to skip, maybe your PMS, maybe you never had PMS. And every month, like me in my late thirties, I was like, holy shit, am I pregnant? <laughs> you know, like, like super, super tender or like the mood, the mood, the mood from ovulation to the time you bleed. Now your mood is cuckoo. You're having maybe some hot flashes. Maybe your hair trigger a little bit. Maybe you can't sleep. So these are, maybe you have a little more vaginal dryness. You say hair trigger, like a little. Like uh, anything. Yeah. Like anything sets you off. Like it, everything is annoying. Yeah. Everybody is an idiot. Yeah. I mean, they are, but. <laughs> Sometimes. You don't tolerate them. And yeah. it can be kind of shocking for women for this to happen in their late thirties. I mean, that seems early for me. I was 46, which I think is yep. pretty typical, but I really yeah. did I mean, like lots of women, no warning. And for me, it was spotty periods. What would you say, is there anything that you were, what was the biggest surprise of these symptoms for you personally? Is there any one thing you wish someone had warned you about? I mean, I definitely had more knowledge than the average person. Right. And, but even for me, um, Oh, wow. I think by the time I was really fully in it in my forties, I was much more of like, I was a menopause expert at that point. Okay. I, I think what I see people get most sidelined about, because I do this all day, every day with my, with my patients, I think the mood changes and that feeling of it really being out of control are probably the most disruptive. And that would be in a tie with, with sleep disruption. And of course they play together, right? Because yeah. if you don't sleep well, your mood's not going to be very good and it's harder to manage your mood totally. and trust your mood. I, but I think that sense of like, wait, is this who I am? Because I never was this person. And am I like a different kind of a person than I thought well, I was or what's goes, happening? Well, and also that goes hand in hand with this feeling. I mean, now I look back at 45 and think I was still so young, but there is that feeling of I'm also getting old and am I yep less attractive and less powerful and less mm -hmm. relevant. And so mm -hmm. it goes hand in hand with this feeling of like my whole identity is shifting, which is super yep. hard. Um, yep. 
we have a couple questions in the audience yeah. to raise, but I also want to say I love your yellow nail polish. And oh, thank you. It's very popular. I'm getting a lot of love about it. <laughs> I've never done yellow. You're inspiring me. Um, and also, this is TMI, but the one thing I really wish someone had told me, I mean, the sleep yeah. super shocked me, but the thing that I thought was super gross, and I don't know if this happens to everyone, are the like black sludgy periods you get at yeah. the very, very end. Yeah. Like, you literally have like clumps of black yeah. tissue coming out of yeah. your Yeah, it's like old stuff. Like that was actually scary. I was like, yeah. what is this? And you know, yeah. it would have been nice if someone had warned me. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of our attendees says, I'd love to hear about how to know, capital K-N-O-W, when you are in perimenopause, especially if you have an IUD and don't have periods. I mean, that's a great question. And I think one of the things that um, I've had to really or gotten to explore both with my patients and with myself, I'm 55 now, um, and I'm not in menopause yet. <laughs> so there's no TMI with me, folks. <laughs> you get your period? Dude, I, st I it's, you never know when it's coming. Wow. But it's, and I found out not that long ago, because my mother had a hysterectomy in her 40s where they took everything out. Very 80s, very awful, yeah, very wrong, common. really yeah. wrong. And so I never knew. And I asked her a couple of years ago, I was like, I have no idea what to expect. And she said, oh, but your grandmother, her mother, your grandmother had a period till she was 55. So I don't know if my mom like implanted that into my brain. And now I'm like, well, and now we'll you're see. Like, it. I have to wait till I'm 55 because grandma E didn't stop till then. I don't know. It's a little alarming, but okay. I'm getting lost in my own, in my own experience. No, um, what, was, what was I saying? Oh, I was answering all, oh, but how to know, really how to know. Really know. It's a good so, question so you have an IUD. This, you're not... If you're only basing it on bleeding patterns, which of course, technically the definition of menopause is no period for 12 months, right? So with an IUD that is changing your periods, um, you're not going to know that. But all these other signs and symptoms will probably start to show up. And I think there's a discussion at, there's a certain discussion that needs to happen at a certain age. And everybody's a little different about this you know, for sure in your late forties, if you've got like a Mirena IUD or an IUD, that's going to stop your periods. You, you need to start talking about this with your physician, because like, at what point should we take it out? Like you right. technically still probably need some birth control. I'd say at 50, you don't need it anymore. However, however, if you're a person who has crazy periods, it would be therapeutic. So the point I'm making to this questioner is you, that you aren't, there is no definition. There's no diagnostic criteria like when you have your thyroid is here, you have high thyroid, you have low thyroid or whatever it is. We don't have that with perimenopause. It's sort of a state of being that goes on for two to 10 years until you're not there anymore. And that's also uncomfortable. And I would think part of the answer to that question, which you kind of said earlier is this is, it's a one of many times in life when you really want to have great medical care because you do mm -hmm. want to be having that discussion. Like, are yeah. you on the UD with hormones or not? And when do you want to go off hormones? And like, I remember when I first had symptoms, I, she offered me, my doctor offered me birth control pills. I was like, I, I'm not. It's actually commonly done. It's not my favorite thing at all. A lot yeah. of people do it because it's easy. Yeah. And I have to say, I have a small number of patients that do prefer it because it's something that they're used to and it feels comfortable to them. Mm -hmm. It's not my way of doing it. Um, but there's other things about having that IU, that kind of IUD in there. Like you could also like, let's say you have, you're not bleeding. You don't, you don't know when you last had a real period, but you're really having hot flashes. You're having other things going on. You could test hormone levels. I mean, it's not hundred percent really where it's at, but you could, there's a world in which you could be doing estrogen and you don't have to take the progesterone because the progesterone is inside your uterus. I don't want to get too deep into menopausal hormone therapy. This is not what this is about, but that's a great question. And I, and really the short answer is you don't know. <laughs> it's a matter of how do you get through where you are? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question about weight. I've increased two clothing sizes and 10 pounds in a year. I relate that happened to me too. I'm yep. exercising more and watching my carb and sugar intake, but I can't seem to lose the weight. Any tips? to get back into skinny drink jeans. I don't mind the new clothing size, but the flabby isn't going away. And no matter how I decrease my food intake, I will just say, she says she can't get rid of the love handles. I just yeah. want to watchers, which I keep talking about. I've been on it for three months and I have lost 12 pounds. Wow. The menopausal and I couldn't lose it for a while, but now I have just from doing Weight Watchers. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's my tip. What's Dr. Suzanne's tip? 
I mean, this is one of the most difficult. And I thought when we were talking in the beginning, like I'm definitely, I'm, I'm just going to leave weight because I know someone's going to ask about it. But that is one of the hallmarks where what you normally did before to maintain your weight just no longer works. So there's a couple of things at play. First of all, as we age, our metabolic rate goes down. Weight gain is a thing that happens to humans that age. The other thing is, and I really dug deep into this when I was writing the book, and didn't always get answers that I wanted. I thought I'm going to find the magic bullet for myself and everybody. Turns out, uh, you know, there's a lot of genetics to this. And so if you look at people in your family, it's not all that they didn't know how to eat and they didn't exercise and da da da. Some of it's genetic. Some it's of genetic. it is a genetic predisposition. And there's some thought that as we as we age as women and we're not making as much estrogen or we're not making any estrogen in the places we were, our ovaries where the fat reserves are, are, they do make some estrogen and that is protective. It's protective for our brains. It's protective for our bones. It may be protective for our heart. So it is very, very, very frustrating. And I think the, the key here is to be gentle. Um, cardio is great for your heart. It is not going to do anything for weight loss. You absolutely must do weight bearing activity. You must, you need to increase your lean body mass. The lean body mass not only will protect you from falls and keep you strong and flexible, it's good for your bones too, but it will increase your metabolic rate. But if you're not lifting weights, you know, honestly, you're not going to burn the same way. And I think the other thing is getting into these really restrictive diets. It's both psychologically damaging and it's actually not that helpful because your body thinks you're starving and you'll hang on to the weight. So what you did even at 40 to get ready for a vacation in three weeks is not going to work. The other thing is that if you're stressed, you're not sleeping, you know, these are all cortisol releasers. They're going to make you hang on to more weight. And I think being in perimenopause during the pandemic is just a hot mess because it's very hard to say what's what. And they're definitely interacting in a way that is not hundred percent knowable. So I hope that helps. I think getting into these really cuckoo crazy diets is not a great idea. I think it's all balanced. It is definitely, you know, you, I think that for someone who doesn't have a propensity to disordered eating things like Weight Watchers Noom, where you're really like watching what you're doing and you're getting some community support and some knowledge can be very, very helpful. Those have worked for me in the past. Yeah, I I'm in a different place now because I'm a little bit like this is triggering my eating stuff and I'm just going to, I'm really focusing on getting strong. I've been working and, on the whole and pandemic. Myself. I mean, I exactly. go through cases where I'm like, I really don't want to think about what I weigh and I just want to love myself. The truth yeah. is it's for the first time in a long time I've just been, I, and I don't have a history of disordered eating. I feel like I'm actually just feeling really healthy. I'm basically just eating fruits and vegetables and protein and drinking wine. Um, which is <laughs> healthy. Um, good. But, but it does make me feel good. And that, that is great. Right. Psychologically yes. and all the rest. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it does, that makes me think about this book that you're recommending on your site called the handbook handbook of wellness medicine, which I'm curious to read because sometimes all of this wellness stuff and particularly at this age to me it seems like it comes down to really it's like sleep drink water eat healthily exercise all, yep. like you know it's all pretty basic and you're typical it's all the old thing. school stuff you know the other thing too because you said something like that you have gotten into a different place and some of it's a mindset and some of it is i've heard this from nutritional medicine specialists that it, the worst part is when you're still in perimenopause and that once you get into menopause, the fluctuate, the hormone fluctuations are no longer, you're not fighting them. I've heard this yep. a lot. And then once you get into the steady state of menopause, it's actually easier to get your habits in place. The handbook of wellness medicine is actually really cool. It's, it's a, it's actually an academic, it's a um, yeah. textbook. It's a textbook designed for academicians. So we have a colleague at Cedar sinai who is the uh, department chair for psychiatry. And he's been involved with, I believe, oh God, you think it's Oxford, I believe uh, is the publisher. Yeah. And he approached me and a friend of mine to do a joint chapter on Ayurveda and uh, Chinese medicine. She's a doctor of Chinese medicine. So, which is funny too. I was like, they're shoving it all into one, but that's fine. One chapter, we got a chapter, we shared it. It was exciting. And I was like, cool, you want me to write this? That sounds great. So this is really for my colleagues. For, so it's really interesting. It's to help our colleagues understand what, what is meant by integrative or wellness medicine. And that, that's a very important statement coming from another academic physician to say, look, this is here. This has been here since before we, with our conventional ways, were here. We have something to learn from them. 
this is what the principles are, this is the data, the evidence, and this is how we use it. Um, well, I'm excited so, to read it. It, yeah. does, it does look very academic, but I love that kind of stuff. And I think, as I said, I think some of it is kind of common. Like, I don't want to be running down crazy diets or ridiculous trends. And, you know, it's always hard to balance that out of like, what supplements do you take? And what's yeah. and how are you just being healthy? Um, another question says, I had hot flushes for a few months about a year ago. Then they stopped for many months. Now they just started again. That happened to me too. Yeah. Very confusing because I thought it was a definite sign, but then it stopped. Yeah. And it, it's, it's very, very common. Usually what I tell my patients who complain about this is I, I get more information about what's going on with their cycle, because typically what I'll see is when people go through periods of time where they're not getting a period, that's when the hot flashes will really start flaring. And then I tell, when I have someone come in and say, all of a sudden my hot flashes stop, I tell them you better get some products because you might get, you might get a period, you know, it's, it's that coming and going, coming and going. It's super, super common. And it does make it challenging because if, if the symptoms are only intermittently disruptive, I think people get concerned, should they do anything about it? And, and right. I feel like if anything is really disruptive, you should do something about it. And that might be herbs and lifestyle and Chinese medicine, and it might be hormones. And I don't have any problem with right. putting people on hormones if it's helping them and they don't have any reason why they can't be on hormones, you don't have to yeah. like have menopause, you know, and we checked the box before you're going to get hormones. That's not accurate at all. And that goes to our next question. And just to that anonymous poster, I also had hot flashes that weren't so bad. They went away for about a year and then they came back insanely. Like I couldn't function. And then I went on HRT when I was like 49, almost 50, mm -hmm. um, which I love. I have to say, I feel great. Um, another attendee says I'm in perimenopause and having lots of symptoms, but I can't take HRT because of breast cancer. What do I do? Any suggestions? Well, I am you. <laughs> so I also had breast cancer. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I was really motivated to write the book that I wrote was because I, I feel like the conversation out there has been really fraught about anything that isn't like FDA approved and conventional. And it's true that the data out there for uh, not allopathic, not pharma, is not as good and that's just, we're never gonna be in a world where there's gonna be a study looking at efficacy for an herb, you know, up against estradiol. So, but I think that doesn't mean that you have to then just suffer, that's awful. So, I mean, I have all sorts of published articles and things and you should definitely read my book um, about the various things that I've used that I think are safe and effective. Everybody is not gonna have the same impact but it depends on what the actual symptom is. There's lots of things out there that I think really, really work that are not gonna increase your risk of your breast cancer returning and are gonna help you live a life that is reasonable because there's no way I could function you know, at certain points without, like right now what I'm taking is something that has uh, pycnogenol. The, um, I mean, full disclosure, I, I'm a medical advisor for this company, but it's because I love the product. It's called Kindra. And pycnogenol is French marine pine bark. It's non-estrogenic. It works for me, great for hot flashes. Black cohosh has great data to support its use for hot flashes. I mean, there's a, number, there's a whole list of things. So it depends on what the issue is. And the other thing I wanna to say to my breast cancer sisters is, you know, if you're having vaginal dryness or sexual dysfunction, the, the fear of using hormones vaginally is totally understandable and not evidence-based. The evidence is very clear that breast cancer is not increased by the use of vaginal hormones. The vaginal hormones are treating the vaginal canal. They are safe, they're effective. So please don't punish yourself or live in the state of fear and anxiety when there's something out there available to you. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And someone in the audience says, I love Kendra. I use their products for vaginal dryness. I wonder if that attendee also uses their funny little applicator. I like Kendra too, but I think the applicator is hilarious. I think the applicator is kind of funny too. I think it speaks to the fact that like, apparently you and I don't have any issue with touching our vagina. We're okay with that. But, but apparently there are people who do. I guess so, so for those people, they yeah. have the applicator. 
So someone says, I'm weaning off my HRT because I was holding excessive water weight. Do you recommend women stay on hormones for their overall health? And that's always a good question. Like how long do you stay on hormones? Yeah. And we don't know. We don't have an answer for that. And that's like a really highly individualized question. I'd like need to know so much more about this person. Yeah. Um, it depends on a million things. Like, do you have a family history of dementia in the women? You know, women are two to three times more likely than men to get dementia and Alzheimer's. That, that study is ongoing. There is a big group in Arizona, at least in Moscone in New York, really looking at like functional MRI and estrogen and all this really stuff that really should have happened a very long time ago to understand that we're suspicious that estrogen will diminish the risk of dementia. So like, if that's a, a concern for you, you know, maybe you want to stay on it forever. I will tell you my people who had extra gnarly perimenopauses really don't want to go off their hormones. And I think it is a thousand percent reasonable to stay on them forever. If you have a stroke or a heart attack, no, you're coming off. Um, you know, if you develop some other medical issue, that might be a problem. You're not going to keep doing it, but I don't, I think the, you know, North American menopause society has put this sort of fuzzy thing, like at three to four years rediscussed, which I think is their way of being like, no, nah, we're not really sure. And I, unfortunately, I think some other doctors who aren't in our community and patients think like, oh, I have to come off at three to four years. That's not accurate, but it, this has to be an ongoing conversation, just like your health is an ongoing conversation. Right. No, I, we hear all the time, actually, from members who say that their doctors are refusing to give it to them anymore, like at 57 or 60. That's mean. And you need a new doctor. That's what I always I mean, say. that's just ridiculous. That's insane. Like, what does, like, what does that even mean? Yeah. Um, I want you to tell us about your book. And I also want your opinion about soy in our diets. Mm -hmm. Um, well, what would you like me to talk about first? <laughs> Let me do soy first and then your book. I'll talk about the soy. Soy is really interesting. Um, soy it's complicated, right? Because first of all, I think you'd have to consume a really a lot of soy. Like uh, if you're talking about food to even get the benefit of the estrogen, the pro-estrogenic uh, oh, benefit. Bad for you. I thought soy. No. So it's very complicated. I think people have misunderstood, but I think there's also issues in the supply chain, right? Like what kind of soy is this? Is this organic? Is it, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole GMO thing, but like, what is the, what is the origin of this soy? How pro and, and is the soy product processed or are you getting like one of the soy derivatives? Like you're taking it as a supplement, genistein, isoflavones. There's actually some really interesting data showing that there's sort of a sweet spot with some of these things that actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. So, and I know I looked a lot into this when I was first diagnosed with breast cancer and worked with an integrative physician here in LA, Mary Hardy, who's a genius. She had run the integrative cancer program at UCLA. And, you know, I heard this a lot from my oncologist too. Soy is not necessarily evil. It's how you're getting it, how much you're getting it, what kind you're getting. So I think I, I have tended to not rely on the soy-based supplements for hot flushes and, and estrogen deficiency. I hate calling it that, but like lower estrogen related symptoms like hot flushes. I don't think that the data is that strong in their mm -hmm. efficacy, but I don't think soy is just like evil. And, and here's the other thing that's interesting. Endomomy. When you look at, huh? Endomomy. Right. And the mama is great. Like enjoy it if you like it. But there's, I think some of this also came from looking at lifestyle stuff in cultures where soy is very, very predominant and looking at the breast cancer rates in those cultures. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at Japanese women per se, per se and like you see a couple of generations later, they're here in the States, they're American, their risks are more like American. So it's, it's not, it's probably, it's more like everything else, it's complicated. Right, right, right. There's no simple answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about digestive issues in perimenopause? My, my only thought here, I remember doing a little research when I wrote my book, is that you have to remember that everything is kind of drying up. So your intestines are also a little drier. So we get more constipated. We get yeah. More, what are your yeah. Thoughts? Well, the other thing that happens, and this is, there's some really interesting data um, on the microbiome, right? So we know that the microbes, the bacteria that live all over our body, but specifically in the gut, they shift and change throughout our lives and they have a huge impact on our, our production of not only immune system um, and central nervous system, uh, but also on our hormonal system. Because Some of this is because 
some I mean, of the way they have an impact on everything, right? Isn't it that does. Like it does. Brain? They call the gut the second brain. It's probably yeah. the first brain. And it's really, really interesting. If you look at how, how hormones are produced and metabolized, the liver has a really important part in estrogen in particular. So it makes sense that as our estrogen levels are changing, and as our gut changes, they're going to have an influence on each other. And it's, I see all the time that people's gut metabolism, and I think this is probably related a little bit to the weight issue and, and maybe a lot and to insulin resistance and all these other things um, that there, we don't understand it completely. I actually interviewed Emron Mayer, who is an amazing genius. He's like the microbiome guy. He has a book called The Gut Immune Connection and the Gut Brain Connection. He's a UCLA professor. And we talked about this and like philosophically, he was like, totally agree. Like, we just don't know all the, the information now have it like from the practical standpoint, do I see women all the time? Have I experienced this bloating, not tolerating foods anymore? hundred percent. Some of this is aging. Mm -hmm. Some of it's just aging. And some of it is probably uh, perimenopause, menopause, just that, that relationship between the hormones and the gut has changed. And I think, again, there's things to do, like really being more mindful about what we're eating, getting, I think people know about probiotics, but prebiotics are the things I was that ask, do you recommend feed. Probiotics? I do, I do for the right reason. I think it's probably better to just feed your gut, right? So the prebiotics are the things that the bacteria want to need to eat. Probiotics are actually putting the bacteria in there. Um, but things like, fermented foods, fiber, that kind of stuff. Really, really important to start looking at those as ways to kind of heal your gut and keep your gut more healthy moving forward so that again, you're optimizing the lifestyle changes you want to make. I think that's a really good point about some of it is just aging. Like we, you know, we yeah. want to we can't blame everything on menopause and perimenopause. Like we're getting older and everything. Exactly. Changing. Yeah. Um, one attendee is saying her most surprising symptom is hives. And then all oh, of them, wow. even feeling like being bitten by bugs. That sounds horrible. I have seen every kind of weird inflammatory condition you can think of. Rashes, dry mouth, dry eyes. I myself had dry mouth. Um, uh, joint stuff, um, the skin. I mean, this is less common, but I am convinced that it is related to perimenopause. And I think this is where, I mean, it could be something else, but it could be that the perimenopause is like unlocking something, you know what I mean? Or the shift is like uh, I had making you more vulnerable. Joint stiffness in the beginning. I'm not having it now, but in the beginning, I would literally sit on the floor. I was like 46 years old and I'd stand up from like sitting cross-legged and my body would creak. Like it was really creaking. <laughs> well, frozen terrible. shoulder, frozen shoulder is a classic perimenopause. And I've talked to friends of mine who are orthopedists and I'm like, oh yeah, totally. That is a woman in her forties or fifties, a thousand percent. We yeah. all know this. I was like, you do. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, now I'd like to hear about your book. You've been so great. And I don't want to take up too much of your time because you have a very busy practice. Um, tell us about your book. What's it called? When's it coming out? How yeah. you it? I'm super excited. So I started about three years ago, I was interviewed by a friend of mine who's 20 years younger than me at The Wing. You guys remember The Wing? Um, and she brought me in to talk about menopause. And I thought, okay, they want me, to, all right. And during the conversation, we had an amazing conversation, right? And I had this like, bing, this aha moment. And I said, oh my gosh, we've lost the intergenerational conversation. Here is Erica, who's, you know, I don't know, like 32 or something at the time really curious. And a lot of the people in the audience were quite a bit younger. I mean, it was a really mixed audience. There's a woman so who's important. pregnant with her mom, we want like people. And I, and I realized like we, like you realize, like we need a community. We need to be talking about this. And from there I developed this. And I, the other thing is that when I would give any kind of talk, I, people would really want to ask about these things. And I just didn't have the time. And I thought, okay, I'm going to devote four hours. I'm going to, I don't know. I called it menopause boot camp, And I started doing them here in LA and we would have a deep dive. We'd do some rituals to kind of bind us together. What became really obvious is that women wanted to be together and feel validated and heard. Mm -hmm. My life partner is a 35 year fitness pro and he works a lot with older women and older people. He comes in and does an amazing module on fitness and he does a workout with us and people really loved it. And so that's where the book came from. So the book is called The Menopause Boot Camp. And it will be coming out. Uh, it's being published by Harper Wave, which is a division of Harper Collins. They do a lot of wellness and medical books. And it will be coming out sometime in 2022. The publisher has it. So we'll see what they're very busy, these publishers. Yeah, <laughs> as you know. 
Um, so I'm super excited because it, it, it brings together my own, you know, 20 plus years in the field with, like I said, my own perspective as a breast cancer survivor, as a doctor of conventional medicine, like I'm in a full on conventional practice here. Okay. I do surgeries. I deliver, you know, like I prescribe, I'm not some like, you know, sage on the mountain. Um, but I also know about herbs and I know how to make herbal preparations and I understand that world as well. And so to me, the sweet spot has been integrating from all of the areas that I can to individualize for the person who's in front of me and for that whole person. So, um, it's if really I exciting. Know, like, I would totally go see you. Do you also do telemed? I do. I do do telemed. I started doing it in the pandemic and I've continued to do it. Um, and that's been a really great experience because I do have, is insurance starting to reimburse for that even like post COVID? Like, is it becoming standard? We'll see what happens. I don't think they're going to be able to, to turn back the, back, the hands yeah. of time. I mean, you know, it's really interesting. The telemedicine community has been working for this for 35 years and the pandemic just accelerated it. So actually what happened in the beginning of the pandemic is as an emergency me uh, uh, method, the insurance companies reimbursed us exactly the same for in-person as telemed. I don't think, I don't see them changing that. I don't know how they're going to get around it. Right. And it's, it yeah. Is. So I still have patients, but I, even in LA, it's like, you don't want to have to drive 45 minutes or an hour and a half across town. If we could do this like this, okay. why should you? you? Why would, exactly. Like I'm going to get blood taken tomorrow here in Brooklyn and then I'll just talk to my doctor. Like I don't need right. to track. And can you see people out of state? Right now you can. So that will be this thing that we have to figure out. Um, if I've seen you before in person, for sure, I can see you anywhere you are. At this point, um, I don't believe I'm uh, breaking any laws, but I have a small number of patients who are out of state. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, right now, there's no issue with that. We'll have to, yeah. we'll stay on top of it. All right, we're gonna give you one last question and let you go. What are your thoughts on the use of CBD and THC for symptoms? Oh my God, I am a huge fan. Anybody who knows me personally knows, we grow. We are grow. I, I mean, I'm the assistant. She's a pothead. Okay. Awesome. I'm not, I'm really, I want to take credit. I can't take any credit. My, my person is like a crazy, who knew what a green thumb this guy had. The pandemic really interesting. I learned a lot. <laughs> wow. So, and I'm, and you know, I make stuff out of it. So I love it. I think you need to understand your source because like any medicine it's powerful stuff. So you want clean, clean, clean stuff, but I use it a lot for sleep for anxiety, for sexual function. And um, I think there are some great brands out there. I think Canopy Health is a good one. Uh, C-A-N-N-A-P-Y, okay. developed actually by my, my co-author of, um, of that textbook of wellness medicine, Lucy ah. Postola. Um, uh, Foria makes great stuff for, um, for sexual pleasure, but also to be honest, like for cramps and pain, it's great. Um, and do you use more CBD or THC or it really depends on what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. I think truthfully, the mix of CBD and THC, they can be synergistic, but for someone who's like new to this, it could, it could knock you out. Yeah, so you gotta be careful. Yeah. yeah. So CBD alone, I think is a better way to start for somebody who's a novice and it's really good for sleep and relaxation. And there's different, there's CBG, there's CBD, there's CBN. This is like a whole other talk. I actually really want my next book to be on this. Um, and I, to be honest, I think you probably need a little bit of the THC if you're going to use the vaginal suppositories or the lubes. Glissant is another one, wonderful um, lube that has CBD in it. Those we did something with a company called Reimagine Wellness. And I thought there's so many good ones. Great. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know them all, but yeah. these are just ones that I know. And these are all female founded friends of mine, <laughs> great, honestly. Great. Yeah. Well, so nice to see you, Suzanne. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thanks, this Nina. Informative. This will be our go-to perimenopause 101 podcast episode that people can call up whenever they have questions. Um, really, really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for taking the time. And thanks for all the great questions, everybody.